Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Larry Lederman, and I am the coordinator for CG's Global Policy Forum in Ottawa. Welcome to this, the third in a series of six forums in Ottawa. I would like to first recognize the presence of some members of the Diplomatic Corps. The High Commissioner of Jamaica, Her Excellency Janice Miller, the Ambassador of Serbia, His Excellency Mihailo Papazoglu, and the Ambassador of Algeria, His Excellency Hossein Megar. We also welcome diplomatic representatives from the embassies of Russia, the United States, Venezuela, the Philippines, Turkey, the High Commissions of Pakistan, and South Africa. And we are also delighted to welcome the founder and chair of the board of directors of the Center for International Governance Innovation, Mr. Jim Balsili, and the president of CG, Rohitan Medora, and other members of the board of CG and its faculty. I would like uh, to now um, mention that we have amongst us some uh, former deputy minister of development of global affairs and now a uh, special advisor on Syrian refugees, Mr. Malcolm Brown, the president of IDRC, Jean Lebel, and members of the Canadian government, including the Privy Council Office, Environment Canada, Department of Global Affairs, Immigration and Finance, the business community of Ottawa, the media, and students and faculty from Carleton University and the University of Ottawa. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rohinton Medora, the president of CG. Larry, thank you, and uh, welcome. It's good to see uh, old friends and new at, um, at CG's ongoing speaker series, the Global Policy Forum. Uh, Larry mentioned uh, that, that the CG uh, board and, and management is here, and that's because we have uh, our own board meeting here, uh, here tomorrow, and so we thought we'd take this opportunity to have uh, Ahmed Galal, who sits on the CG board, uh, give a talk to us this evening. We've also taken the opportunity to change slightly the format that many of you, uh, you would be uh, usually used to. And so uh, I will uh, introduce to you Arif Lalani, another one of my bosses on the CG board, and then he will formally introduce Ahmed. And we've also asked uh, Scott Clark to act as a bridge and a respondent between the Q&A and, and Ahmed's uh, comments. Uh, Arif Lalani, many of you would know and needs no introduction to a group like this, but will still get a brief one. He has had a long and distinguished career in Canada's foreign service. He's a product of the University of British Columbia. He's led the Policy Bureau in the Department of Foreign Affairs. He served as ambassador to uh, Jordan, um, uh, Afghanistan, and is now currently our ambassador to the United Arab Emirates. He has also had postings in many other cities, including New York and Washington, DC. Uh, he's the Government of Canada's representative on the CG board, and we're thrilled to have him because he brings with, with him uh, uh, experience with other think tanks. He is also on the advisory board of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, the Ditchley Foundation in Canada, and, and elsewhere. And he recently got uh, a Doctor of Letters from the Canadian University in Dubai. So before I turn it over to uh, Arif to run the evening, let me also say a word about our respondent, Scott Clark. Uh, again, many of you would know him. He's a former Deputy Minister of Finance. He was Canada's ED to the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C., and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London. Uh, and he has most recently been working with the government of Ukraine on a series of financial restructuring issues. So, uh, Arif, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rohinton. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, in July 2013, as Egyptians struggled through yet another change in government, 70% of the people in Egypt lived below the poverty line. The budget deficit was about $30 billion. Foreign reserves were dwindling, and foreign investors were scarce. In this context, Dr. Ahmed Galal, who had resisted the call to politics by former presidents Mubarak and Morsi, answered his country's call at a historic turning point and was sworn in as the interim finance minister of Egypt. Later that year, 
Ahmed Galal would also miss his first meeting ever of the CG board. <laughs> it also marked, I think, the first and only time when the board was pleased that Dr. Galal was serving elsewhere. We could not have been prouder of his appointment and we could not have been more confident that Dr. Galal was the right man at the right time to keep a steady, smart, objective hand on Egypt's financial future as it worked toward another election and another transition. To us at CG, particularly those board members, and most of them are here, who have served much longer than I, all of them would repeat the same words when we describe Dr. Galal. Intellect, integrity, and patience, exactly the qualities that Egypt and the region needed in their leadership at the time. Those were the same qualities that former Prime Minister Paul Martin recognized when he suggested to the founder and chairman of CG, Jim Balsili, that he consider Ahmed Galal for the board. And according to Jim, it was absolutely one of the best decisions he made early on as the chair of CG. Dr. Galal is also that rare and valuable breed in public policy circles, for he is an academic, but also a practitioner. And therefore, he can conceptualize, but also execute public policy. He is also the managing director of the Economic Research Forum, an independent think tank which he founded and which is regarded as the leading think tank on Middle East economics. Dr. Galal worked at the World Bank since 1984, and during this long tenure, he served as an industrial economist in the Europe, Middle East, and North Africa regions, as senior then principal economist at the research arm of the bank, and as an economic advisor at the private sector development department. Dr. Galal has also published extensively on issues such as privatization, regulation, monopolies, trade and monetary policies. Dr. Galal holds a PhD in economics from Boston University, and his research interests are unemployment, regional integration, and the informal sector. When his term as finance minister uh, of Egypt ended, we were immensely pleased to welcome him back to the CG board, where he continues to help lead the organization as the world's leading authority on innovative solutions to the international governance challenges facing the world. In the region where Dr. Galal has lived and where I have been working for the past three years, there is a dire need for new models and renewed partnerships. Faced with violent Islamist extremism, ultra-conservative interpretations of the faith, and governance leadership that struggles to find the right models for a modern, open society based on economic development, Dr. Galal's thought leadership as a practitioner and an academic are invaluable. And here in Canada, we are at that magical moment in democracies. And I don't mean the hackneyed phrase of peaceful transition. Of course our transition a couple of weeks ago was peaceful. What I'm talking about is the opportunity that change of government from one party to another offers. It is a moment of possibilities. It is a time when new governments look at resilient challenges with fresh eyes and seek new perspectives. Prime Minister Trudeau's government has stated publicly that it wishes to reach out to the Arab world and more generally pursue a more engaged global affairs agenda. Our gathering this evening, therefore, with Dr. Galal is timely and I hope valuable to the policy establishment gathered here tonight. We at CG could think of no one better to lead the conversation we're about to have tonight than Dr. Galal. And with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, very much indeed. Uh, and that was the best introduction I've ever had so far. I think every time I'm invited anywhere, I'll ask them, please bring Arif. He's the only one who can <laughs> introduce me better than I ever can do. Uh, thanks, Rohentum, for the invitation. Thanks to CG for uh, being here. And I feel like uh, I know Canada. I mean, through my association with IDRC and CG, it has been quite a while. I've been coming here at least for a decade, uh, at least twice a year. I've had the privilege and opportunity to learn a lot more about the country. And the one thing that really stands out in my head that I can't let go uh, of is that Canada is a fantastic country. 
Now, thinking about it from outside, I'm not a Canadian. Uh, it's a country that's not too big to be scary, and it's not too small to be insignificant. Canada is very well positioned to play a wonderful role on the international scene. And if you don't believe me, just think of CG, because CG is a symbol of that. It's a Canadian institution, but guess what? What it focuses on is international governance, improving international governance and innovation. So that, that it's always wonderful to be here. I always enjoy uh, meeting lots of friends and friendly faces in the audience that I'm familiar with. And I always learn a great deal. And I hope on my part that I contribute a little bit to uh, whatever uh, endeavor that I'm here for. Let me turn to today's subject and begin with a confession. In preparing for this talk, I decided to cheat a little bit. I decided to go and look at what other people have said about the Middle East in the context of the Global Policy Forum and in other events that were handled by uh, CG. And I admired a great deal the quality of what was being said. However, I didn't recognize the Middle East in what I have seen. Let me explain a little bit what I mean. This is all introductory. It's going to take me a little time to get there. In one case, somebody was making the broad point that the Middle East is immune to democracy. Why? Simply because they never have had a history of democracy. And what a silly argument. Think about Latin America 30 years ago. Think about Eastern Europe. Think about Asia. Think about Africa. And actually, they had no history of democracy. And they now, if you look around, Hardly any of them is not. And as a matter of fact, the now well-established democracies were not one of these days. It's a bit in the distant past, but it's also true. So that's one story that I didn't buy. The other story that I didn't buy either was the one that says Islam and the values that the religion carries is just not compatible with democratization and development. That's just now, the details are a lot, but, but this is really the basic point that was being sold, and I don't buy that either. For one thing, we know some, democrat some uh, very well-established democracies that do have Islam as a religion. I mean, you can think of Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia, and in fact, you can even think of Kuwait, and you can think of the transition democratization process in Egypt and Tunisia, and to some degree, uh, Morocco and Jordan. Uh, more seriously, though, there is a, a, a really two very good studies that don't talk about anecdotes and concrete countries. One study by Pack and Noland, or Noland and Pack, in which they run cross-country regressions over a long number of years for a lot of countries, and they find absolutely no association, none whatsoever, negative association between Islamic countries and economic growth. That's one study. There is another study by Caroline Freund and... Uh, uh, Melise Jude uh, from the World Bank, which also did another cross-country regressions covering a lot of countries over a long period of time, and they found absolutely no negative association between Islamic countries and democratization. So the two stories don't have, do, I don't buy either one of them. So what's my story? And I find them to be too negative. And what I'm trying to do today is hopefully, the only thing you hear about the Middle East is actually bad news. Just think about what's happening, terrible things that are happening in Paris and uh, before that in Beirut and then in Sharm el-Sheikh. So the, the bad news are just too many. The good news are too few. So I'm going to try to tell you a story that, is, that carries some positive angle to it in thinking about the Middle East. And this is not because I wish to think so. I am going to try to convince you logically based on arguments and history and all sorts of things. Uh, why I am saying uh, what I am saying. There is something called the modernization theory. It came out in the late 50s. And what the theory says is the following. It says that when countries' uh, per capita income rises, when people become educated, when urbanization takes place, all urbanization is a very interesting uh, point because with urbanization, apparently, tribal mentality and ethnicity kind of take secondary seat. Therefore, collectively, when countries look like this, the probability of becoming democratic increases enormously. 
And guess what? The Middle East has been experiencing a lot of these. Per capita uh, income has been rising. Boys and girls are all going to school nowadays. Uh, three, the cities are becoming much more, in fact, not only urbanized, but congested. Too many people. Just visit Cairo and try to go through the traffic. Impossible. It's easier to come here than to go to the other part of town in Cairo. I happen to believe that this is literally what has been going on in the Middle East. And I also happen to believe that the Arab Spring was a reaction to the change that were taking place in the region. Having said that, that's not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Because I don't want to be claiming, therefore, that democracy is around the corner, that there will be no detours or sit-backs. Uh, on the contrary, democratization is a process that takes years, not months. And people who expect things to happen the day after are just daydreaming. They just have no idea. On average, we know that transition has taken, uh, transition in Eastern European countries had, has taken, on average, about 12 years. It has been only about four years since the events have taken place in the Middle East. Give them time. Um, why am I talking about so much politics and democratization? And I am an economist by training. I really know a little bit about economics and hardly anything about politics. Well, it's just because I happen to also believe another theory. And the other theory is one that has been developed and advanced and put together nicely and neatly by two guys in, in uh, Harvard, MIT, uh, Darren Ashimoglu and uh, Jim Robinson. And they have a fantastic book that I invite everyone to read. It's called Why Nations Fail. And they go through all the arguments. So essentially, in fact, Jim, when he was telling me about the book, I told him, why don't you do Why Nations Succeed? Why is it that you want to have? He said, our publisher insist insisted that we have Why Nations Fail because it's more uh, attractive. In any case, the basic point in that book is the following. It's a very simple, it's a 600 pages, more or less. But the basic idea is very simple and straightforward. And it says the following. It's not uh, history that you are condemned to. It's not religion, it's religion that would rule your life. It's actually the political institutions. Countries that have what they call inclusive political institutions are likely to be the countries that come up with what they call inclusive economic institutions and inclusive economic policies. And they are the countries who are able to achieve sustainable and shared economic growth, period takes a long time for them to say that, but that is really what the story is about. So I, even as an economist, I became, not, not, not then, but from before, and that kind of crystallized the ideas. I happen to believe now, if a country has economic problems, go and talk to the politicians. If the politicians fail, the country fails. So what I am going to be saying then is telling you a story about the economics of the Middle East, not about Egypt. I'm not going to be talking about the tough job that I uh, had to deal with at one point in time. I run an institution called the Economic Research Forum that really focuses on the Arab countries, Iran, and Turkey. So I like to be sincere to what I do for a living. And I like to talk about the region rather than talk about um, one country at, and one particular episode. Uh, the story that I'm going to be telling is the following. I mean, I'm going to try to answer three questions. The first question is, is the Middle East on a path of sustain, sustainable and shared economic growth or not? That's my first question. My second question is, if not, why? My third question is going to be, and if it's going to be politics from what I have just been saying so far, you must have figured out that I'm going to be saying it didn't work as well and the politics was a problem. And I, the question becomes, so given the change that are taking place in the region, can we say something to predict the future? Can we say something meaningful about what to expect in the future? Let me just conclude that in long introductory part by saying two small things. One is I'm not going to be talking about conflict, countries in the region in conflict. So forget about talking about the conflicts in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, and Libya. This is not what I'm going to be talking about. And the last one small bit that I want to mention here is that part of what I'm going to say is derived from an edited volume that I did with a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Ishaq Diwan, that's coming out in out of Pilgrave. 
uh, in January 2016, and we call it the Middle East Economies in Times of Transition. Let me start with the first question. Is the Middle East on a path of sustainable and shared economic growth? And it's a bit tricky when you begin to look at the numbers and, and try to interpret them, right? So let's start with growth. In fact, when you look at the numbers, the region did very well. Uh, looking at the average rates between mm, 1980 and 2013, the region made uh, some sort of 3.7 uh, average rate of growth per year. And that compares quite favorably to most regions in the world. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it was only during the same period. It was 2.8. In Latin America, it was, it was, um, it was uh, no, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was 3.1. In uh, Latin America, it was 2.8. In uh, Europe and Central Asia, it was 1.9. So if I were to be wanting to be just conveying a positive story on the growth uh, agenda, I would say, yeah, the region did better than everybody else. So what's the problem? Well, I think there is a problem. The problem is that that economic growth is not sustainable. And I have three reasons why. It's not sustainable in the first instance, because it does not involve structural transformation. Most of the economic growth came from factor accumulation, and in particular, labor. Labor growth has, in fact, contributed no less than 50% of the growth that has been achieved. Very little contribution came from pro productivity improvement. The incentive regimes and the economic policies that dominated most of these countries over these decades were of the kind that did not promote competition, did not promote entrepreneurship on the, our hard work or innovation on the country. They were policies that were tailored to please a few people around the rulers. It was creating barriers. It was uh, giving privileged access to all sorts of resources, whether they are land or credit or what have you. That is not a recipe for sustainable growth. Low productivity, those who are making it are not the guys who are working hard. That is not a sustainable growth. Let me give you another reason why that's not a sustainable growth. Uh, most of the growth did not come from exports. The, the uh, leaving aside oil exports, which is really the bulk of what the region does export, non-traditional products or exports have been incredibly, have, have not grown fast, and they were narrow in a few products, and they did not have much knowledge or technology content. The region tried, in fact, to do free trade agreements with the major blocs or trading partners, with uh, the EU, with the US. But this is what we call in economics, they were shallow free trade agreements. They were not the NAFTA-like. Shallow in the sense that they were liberalizing trade on the borders, but not, do not involve any reforms behind the borders. No competition policy, no promotion of investment, no. Uh, labor environment, all sorts of things that usually good FTAs do bring about. And in fact, they tried, the, the Arab countries have tried uh, also to um, have their own free trade agreements, right? The, 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 they started the process at the time the EU started, something like 50 years ago. Uh, I have a book I edited with Bernard Hoffman that came out from Brookings 10 years ago. It says something, uh, the title is something like Arab Economic Integration Between Hope and Reality. And it turned out to be more hope than reality. In a, in a way, they got together, they agreed to trade with each other what they don't produce, what they don't have. I sell you what I don't have, you send me what you don't have, sort of thing. And it stayed at the level of, of uh, goods and services. And there was absolutely no discussion of labor or capital. The region is a very interesting region. It's distinguished by countries that have excess or abundance of capital and scarce labor. These are the Gulf countries. And then you get the labor abundant, capital scarce countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, and the rest of it. And essentially, what they should have been doing is really talking about 
labor mobility and capital mobility, not about goods and services that they, don't, that they don't produce or export or engage in trading anyway. So it was all messed up. I remember when Amr Musa became the Secretary General of the Arab League, he, uh, he invited me to give him advice, and he said, what should I do in economics between these countries? I said, don't do anything that they have done so far and do something new. And I suggested focusing on labor and capital. Nothing much has happened. It takes a lot of other things. It takes political will, a willingness to surrender sovereignty to some degree. It takes something that's not there. That is why nothing much has happened so far. Let me give you one third reason why growth is not sustainable. I think I'm spending a bit too much time on one issue. The kind of economic growth that the region has achieved was not job creating. Uh, it was capital intensive. It was not, um, you know, the paradox is that um, it was hiring people in government rather than letting them in the private sector. Uh, the region has done really well on educating the population. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, how well educated the, education, the, 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 the new generation uh, has become. Yet, I am reminded of another paper by Land Pritchett from Harvard, who, the title of which is something like, where did all the investment in education go? It went down the drain. Because you invest so much in education, you don't uh, give them the opportunities to capitalize on the human capital that they have accumulated, and what do you get at the end? A waste of resources. That is why, in addition, growth is not sustainable. So I have three reasons why growth is not, is not sustainable, even though it's good. I mean, 3.7, better than other people, but the foundations of that growth is not sustainable. What about the idea of shared economic growth? Because I told you, is the region able to uh, produce sustainable and shared economic growth? The shared economic growth is, wha is what I want to talk about a little bit now. And also on paper and on the face of it, it looks like the region is doing actually quite well. There is a, a very good uh, paper by uh, Mustafa Nabli and um, Sami Bibi. Sami Bibi, I think, works for the Canadian government here. He's of uh, Tunisian origin. Anyway, they did a survey of the literature on equality in the region, and they concluded that the region is a moderate inequality region based on something called Gini coefficients. And Gini coefficients are calculated based on household surveys. Basically, you collect information about what people uh, income, in fact, most cases, expenditure, and uh, the variations between different groups and who's getting uh, a lot more than the other guys. And when they look at the Gini coefficient, on average, it's about 32%. Per, 32%. Compared with Latin America, it's in the 40 and 50 even. In Brazil, it's probably, I, mean, I don't want to get into uh, naming names here. But in any case, the region really looks good, just like it did look good on the issue of growth. It also does look good on issues of inequality. Not true. Two reasons. One, household expenditure are problematic. First of all, their expenditure is not income. And the variations between different, between people when it comes to their income is, is much, much higher than the variation when it comes to expenditure. That's one. Second, household expenditures typically miss top income groups. If you are very rich, if you are making so much money, you tend not to be included in the household surveys. You either don't report it to begin with, or alternatively, they don't come and ask you. Either way, whatever numbers you get at the end of the day are really not accurate. Leaving that aside, we have done at ERF over the last few years quite a few studies on the so-called equality of opportunity. So forget about what people have. Let's talk about whether people start the race from the same starting line. And on every possible outcome, the results are not favorable. For instance, if you want to know about the chance well, we, you have to, we, com we usually compare the, 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 the um, groups of the population and the advantaged ones as opposed to the disadvantaged ones. The, di the advantaged ones will be the kids that are born to rich parents, their parents are educated, they live in good areas, as opposed to the opposite for the disadvantaged. And whichever, whenever you compare the kid 
in the two groups, uh, the results are just uh, in Yemen. The advantaged uh, baby uh, has, um, you know, almost 100% uh, probability of living in the first year. For the disadvantaged one, it's one in 10 that dies in the first year of, of being born. In Morocco, it's one to five. In Egypt, it's one to three. So the chance that the baby dies in the first year is much, much higher uh, when they are born to circumstances that they are not responsible for and ethically unjustified. Uh, that is for, for child mortality. Education attainment is it's more or less the same. I have so many numbers, but I, I don't want to get uh, into. There, there, there is a one, one study that I want to uh, cite here on the Egyptian case because I find it really counterintuitive and, and, and uh, interesting. Um, we have a policy of free education for all at all levels of education. And the justification for that policy is, is that you want to give equal opportunity to everyone. That, that sounds really good, no? The truth is, when someone looks at the facts, who actually are the kids who go to university and who are the kids who don't, the probability of going to university for the advantaged kid is something like 98%. For the poor kid, it's about 5%. So this is a disconnect, total disconnect, between what the policy intentions are and what actually transpires uh, at the end of the day. So on inequality of opportunities, the region is not doing well. And then the last bit that I want to make here uh, in relation to questions of equity is that I said nothing about distribution of wealth. I, I, we, some of you who are interested in that area, I'm sure would be aware of what Piketty has uh, just done a couple of years ago, uh, capital in the 21st century, uh, where he basically showed that the, the inequality with respect to wealth is widening and it's, it's discouraging. We have nothing about this for the Middle East as yet. Why? We don't have the data. It's as simple as that. So, just to conclude that part, how am I doing, Mr. President? I have 15 minutes to go? Oh, well, it's not bad. Because that, that's the part that I think was going to take some time. Um, the, so, so, on both growth and the sustainability of growth on equality and inequality and whether it's true or not, the region does it, looks like it's doing well, but it's not. Let me, I cannot really conclude that part without talking in particular about the oil-rich countries or the natural resource-rich countries because the region has more than its, I mean, has an enormous uh, share of, of uh, natural resources. Uh, in fact, according to OPEC, the... Uh, the region has something like 66 of international proven oil reserves and 44% of international proven natural resource reserves. So you cannot really talk about the region without saying, saying something in particular about natural resource countries because they are not quite the same as the rest. And in that particular case, economists are funny people. They just find themselves little, I am an economist, so I can say that. Uh, they find a little corner and they spend all their time on it. And what do they do when it comes to natural resources? They tell you about the Dutch disease, right? A Dutch disease is when you get a lot of foreign capital and your currency appreciates and that is discriminates against tradables in favor of non-tradables. And basically, you don't export, you don't diversify, so you, you, got, you got a bad disease. That's, that's basically the story. Or alternatively, they focus on oil price volatility and economic growth volatility. And in fact, they find evidence because oil prices do fluctuate quite a bit. Economic growth does fluctuate quite a bit. And on average, as a matter of fact, oil-rich countries grow slower because of that volatility than the non-gifted uh, countries. So that is one part, and the region has its share of that. But that is probably the least damaging effect, in my view, 
The other damaging, more serious uh, damaging effect is the impact of natural resources on governance. Uh, we all know that no representation without taxation. When governments have a lot of money, they don't necessarily have to democratize. They don't have to open up. Uh, I can afford giving economic handouts, and I don't have to give you something else. So although the countries, but yeah, I mean, let me also be uh, more balanced here because it's also untrue to just mention the negatives. These countries have a lot of resources, and they have used it quite effectively in many ways. They have done a lot of infrastructure. They have educated their people. Uh, they have created some industries. So they have used the resources to make some progress because these countries, w without the oil, without the natural resource, would have been very different countries. On the other hand, they have some negative side effects, if you like. That's my answer to the first question. Second question, I promise you, is going to be much shorter. So we have a region that seems to be growing. Uh, inequality seems not to be too bad. But the underlying explanation is that this is not sustainable nor shared widely. And I think we have an issue with the issue of natural resources. By the way, most of the liter literature on natural resources tells you the following. Tells you that countries that are lucky to have a lot of natural resources, they typically do very well with it when they have good governance. The trouble is when they don't, because it works the other way around. And you, you get into a vicious circle where natural resources have a negative impact on governance, and not very good governance essentially leads to not a good or a full exploitation of the natural resources. No surprise, for instance, that countries like Norway, Canada, uh, Chile do very well with their natural resources, not everybody else. There are good ex enough examples of the opposite kind that I don't want to name them right now. Um, if this is the outcome, if this is how the region did, and I don't think it did as well as it could, for sure, what, why is that the case? And you get tons of explanations. I've given you two explanations that I don't agree with at the beginning, history and religion. There's a third one that comes from Washington this time. And this is, these countries didn't adopt the right policies. You know, they didn't do the, on the monetary policy, they didn't do flexible exchange rate, and they didn't uh, manage their resources well reserves well uh, on fiscal policies. They went into white elephants and ra ran big budget deficits. I, basically, if you want to fix all these problems, just get your economics right. What is fundamentally flawed about that argument is economic policies are made by politicians, not by economists. It's not good enough to know the right answer. It is equally, if not more importantly, that those who are taking the decision are picking the right policies, right? And why would they do that? In economics, we have this funny thing. Everybody is maximizing something. Consumers are maximizing utility. Uh, producers are maximizing profit. Well, you ask yourself, what are politicians maximizing? Staying in power. It's as simple as that. They just want to prolong staying in power. That is what it is about. So staying in power, does it necessarily mean or is equal to maximizing welfare? Who said so? Not at all. Big distance between the two. So it is actually politics. It is not that these countries decided not to, to, to adopt the right policies. They probably know them. That's not a question of knowing. It's a question of wanting and willing and interested. What is the story about politics and political regimes in the region? Lots of stories, uh, political scientists are, are, you know, they write quite a bit. And the, the number of books on the Middle East and the political economy of the Middle East is just countless. And it has proliferated after January 2011. But the one story that I buy is the following. There is something called authoritarian bargain model, whereby the rulers make a deal with their citizens. I give you some economic handouts, is something I referred to earlier, and you don't ask me for anything else. In fact, they went so far as to even want their sons to inherit the ruling after they are gone. After staying for 30 years in office, they still want their sons to be the, the next president. 
So it is, um, and and that and that formula did function in the region for a long time. And then came, this is up till the 70s or thereabout. And then in the 80s and 90s, something happened. There was a, a, a wave of liberalization. In fact, there is a very interesting statistic that I would like to quote today based on a study by uh, Diwan and Kamit. Uh, they looked at public expenditure in relation to gross domestic product over 50 years. And it turned out that government expenditure relative to, to GDP, on average, for the region, was going up all the time until the 70s where it became something like 50 to 60% of GDP. So the state was really getting a lot of money. The state was spending a lot of money somehow. And then after that, when the liberalization has taken place in the 80s and 90s, uh, public expenditure relative to GDP came down on average for the region to something like 25 to 30 percent of GDP. That is essentially half. So what does that mean? The government is spending less on what? On education, on health, on, on, on all sorts of services that the middle class was benefiting from. Essentially, what you really had in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s is that the middle class was hurting. The government was not was reneging, was changing its side of the bargain, was not anymore giving the economic handouts and the benefits that they used to give, and they are taking them away. That alienates the middle class. Something else was happening at the same time. There was the emergence of the phenomenon called crony capitalism. That is, a few people around the rulers who were making, getting all the benefits and to hell with everybody else. So you get a, a, a double whammy, if you like. On the one hand, you get the middle class hurting because the government is withdrawing, and at the same time, you get crony capitalism and widespread perception of corruption, and that, that did it, in a sense. I mean, then came the, 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 you know, at the end of 2010, uh, early 2011. This is when everybody went to, to the streets. A lot of people tend to, t uh, or keep telling you that it's young, it's the young who went to the streets. Not true. It's actually the middle class. The middle class including the young and the middle-aged and the old. I didn't go, my son did. Uh, so that is, then you get an Arab Spring. Um, that did not happen in oil-rich countries by the means of the resources that they have. Um, And I guess the question is, what comes next? I mean, and that's my third question. So if you're worried about time, I still have five minutes to go, no? Uh, what, what can we expect going forward? This is really difficult. Uh, and you know, I can act like a politician and I tell you, you know, we are determined to do it and we are gonna get there no matter what, and that doesn't work. Right? You're not going to believe anything I say if I do that. And I'm not very good at it either, anyway. But uh, we know that you cannot lump all the countries in the region in one pot. Conflict countries, leave them aside, and uh, something hopefully will, will happen there for the better. The oil-rich countries, I think it's going to take a little long because the pressure is not there. The countries that are likely to probably make progress are the transition countries. And the transition countries by which I mean countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, uh, Jordan, Lebanon in a funny way. Uh, but, but what do we know? I mean, I, it's one thing to say what I have just said. Another one is to go a little further. And, and see what has been the experience of transition elsewhere. And there is a really wonderful couple of studies in that regard. One that looked at 100 countries, uh, over 100 countries, if transition countries, over a long period of time. And they came up with some very interesting uh, statistics um, that I would like to quote you. Thirty-eight percent of the hundred countries and above uh, and more made 
uh, the transition, completed the transition to democratization in a relatively short period of time. 29% of transition cases failed. 10% moved gradually forward, and 22% went in reverse from democracy to autocracy. There are no guarantees in life. Things can go in any direction. However, what is really good about studying transitions of that kind is what insights, what, predict, what, are, the, what are the factors that help you predict moving in one direction or another. And I have five of them to, to share with you. Uh, the first one is countries that make the transition tend to have an elite that is willing to make compromise. And I would bet you anything, this is what has, has happened both in Egypt and Tunisia compared with what has not happened in Syria. In the Egyptian and Tunisian case, the army and the police took the side of the population, the, the rebellions. You made the initial transition. In the Syrian case, there was a division. And that's why you get the chaos that you have. So elite unity is really turned out in looking at a lot of experiences of transitions, turned out to make a big difference. So that is one. Uh, the other one in sight is the one that has to do with sharp breaks. Transitions, when you have a new regime that is totally different from what was before, without the foundations, without building the infrastructure, without connecting with everybody in town, sort of thing, they are likely to fail. And in the Egyptian case, that's what happened with the Muslim Brotherhood. They came to power suddenly. They had no uh, link with the rest of the institutions and the populations. They wanted to do everything in no time, their way for, them, for themselves, and it just didn't work. People went to the street again. And for those who, for those who say that this was a, a coup, I mean, they need to remember that the army took the side of the people on the street in January 2011, and they took the side of the people on the street in July 2013. So they are two equivalent episodes. But the point that I want to convey here is the idea of countries that make the transition to democracy uh, bring regimes that are not totally disconnected with, with previous uh, regimes. Let me give you a third insight. Countries that have uh, bureaucratic capacity and the rule of law they tend to be countries that are able to make that, that transition compared with countries that don't. And the best example to illustrate that is Libya. Because what has happened in the Libyan case is that the, 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 the country really didn't have the institutions. They didn't have neither the state capacity nor the rule of law. The institutions were not there. It was the leader and everybody else. The general and all soldiers, no, nothing in between. So it, it disintegrated, it didn't, it didn't work. I have one interesting one about, two interesting ones, subtle really. They are not really that straightforward. The one about what happens in countries with different ethnic groups. Is that something that helps democracy or the other way around? Apparently, the story is that if the ethnic groups don't get into a conflict and a fight, in fact, countries that have different ethnic groups are better qualified to make the democratization. Why? Because in a democratic system, everybody has to concede something to the, re to the rest. So what looks like it's a conflict, it's, uh, you, know, you have e multiple ethnic groups, it's bad news. Well, it turned out that in some cases, it was a, a blessing in disguise. So that is, that's one insight that you would not think about it in, in without mm, getting closer. The last one also uh, is, is that kind of subtle. Uh, autocratic regimes that have a lot of resources are not likely to make the democratization. However, when they do decide to make it, in fact, they are more likely to succeed than the other cases. So the concept of a, a benevolent dictatorship, the concept of someone with the resources, they decide they want to make the move, it turned out historically in a lot of experiences that that helps with the democratization process. I am done with my three questions. Let me just conclude. What I have told you so far, I hope it was positive. I meant it to be positive. I told you the region is not doing, 
looks like it's doing well, but it's not really doing as well as one would like to think. I told you that the politics was not good for a long period of time, and it began to improve, and there is a chance, there is a real opportunity for things to move in the right direction. And I gave you some insights that at least suggest that some countries in the region are probably better positioned to take off. What I really hope uh, at the end of the day is that a few, well, a decade later or something, will think back and say, January 2011 was a critical juncture where countries like Egypt and Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan took the right road and they made progress. I'm sorry it took me too long, but thank you for your for listening to me. Well, let me begin by saying it's a little intimidating to follow Ahmad, um, given his, his comments, which were extremely interesting and well thought out. And I'm trying to think, what could I say uh, based on my own experience, or um, were there some themes or issues that he touched on that I've also encountered? And I also am an economist, and indeed when I think about that, I've been either learning or teaching or practicing for 50 years, and yet I'm still learning, and I've spent some time now in the Ukraine, and, and before that I spent five years really uh, learning more economics in Eastern Europe with the transition from former Soviet economies to uh, market-based economies is what we would call them in those days. And so there, the word transition um, came up in, in Ahmed's comments and institutional reform and governance uh, as being key issues in terms of economic growth. So if you're a policy advisor in Canada or in an advanced or G7 country, you know, you don't encounter a lot of the, or most of the major problems that these countries face. So we live a, a pretty sheltered life as policy advisors here, and we have a new government today, and they walk in, and you got a nice public service, everything's good, you know, you change your policies, you get your briefing books, and everybody's happy. And um, last December, I was called by our ambassador in Ukraine, could I, come over uh, and help the new Minister of Finance. She'd just been made Cabinet Minister and didn't have a, any idea what to do. She'd never been in the public service, didn't know, you know, she was committed, and there had been an armed revolution, people had died, and she needed some help. So could I, it was Sunday, and could I leave Tuesday and be there Wednesday? And I said, well, what, what would I possibly be doing? And, and he said, well, just, you gotta give her some help, uh, because, it's important that this government succeed in putting the conditions in place for reforms and economic growth. This is their last chance. It's been a decade of failure. And if this government doesn't succeed, there's going to be a civil war. Uh, so I thought, well, I should probably stay in Canada. I don't think I can really help her very much. But I did go over there thinking, OK, I'll do my best. And I met with the minister. And we had a talk for about an hour or so. And I, I still afterwards couldn't figure out what exactly I should do, except I had decided that the advice she really needs was how to organize her office. I forget, uh, you know, giving uh, advice on the IMF who were there and they needed a new program, forget advice on tax reform, all the things that I had some experience in. My experience the next two weeks was actually saying, uh, oh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get rid of everybody in your office and we're going to give you a secretary and we're gonna give you a chief of staff, and we're gonna give you a communications person. And uh, she told me I don't trust any of my deputy ministers, and I said, well, that's fair, because there was so much corruption uh, in the Ukrainian system, because it's a former, it still was a Soviet system, which was based on essentially corruption. Um, so I said, well, we'll just have to work around them. We'll have to get some special advisors in for you, like from the IMF or the EBRD or wherever we could get uh, some people to come and help you. And, but right now, uh, you know, you're not able to function as a minister to make decisions because you have no one around you that you can trust. And you have no one around you who can answer the phone for you. 
you don't even have a scheduler, right? So, you know, you, you need to first get people in your office that you can trust. So that took me two weeks. Um, in the meantime, she had to worry by the fact that she had a budget to do, she had the IMF there, uh, she couldn't trust anybody. You know, you know, when I say that there's corruption, you have to understand in a country like that that a deputy minister gets paid $100 a month. All right, so you go figure. When you're in the meeting with these people, you look, that's a very nice suit this person's wearing, he's driving a nice car. How, do he does, how does he do that on $100 a month? Well, it's corruption. Every government agency is corrupt, from the ministers down, okay? So you have a new government that came in with a commitment to reform, and what she would say to me is, it's not the war in the East, which is bad enough. It's, it's, it's the five oligarch armies that run this country, right? So you have oligarchs who own communications, own gas and oil, own mining, and whatever else. So the country's divided up in basically fiefdoms, and all of them have armies with tanks and artillery and mercenaries and everybody else. And it's actually those armies that were doing a lot of the fighting, but they could overthrow the government at any time. And yet civil society was saying to the government, we just went through a terrible revolution. We want reform. We want you to break up all those oligarchs and change the structure of government. And then you had the IMF coming in there and saying, if you want our money, you have to reform. You have to stop the corruption. So it's a rather daunting uh, exercise to go to a country like that and say, uh, before we lend you money, before we make any commitment to you, you've got to take on these huge tasks. And yet, you have the economy right now sinking, right? And I, mean, I was talking about bad news, good news. There's no good news there. It's all bad news, right? And it's going to be a long time before there is any good news. So that's the type of reform. So if you ask yourself in those countries, and Ukraine is not unimportant. I mean, when you're in the Ukraine, they sort of, look, we have to struggle to get $15 billion to finance us from the EU and the IMF. And yet, look at what's going into Greece. And yet we're, we're sitting here between Europe and the East, right? And we can't get anyone to come and help us. So that's the kind of reform that's going on there. A, it's to use your terminology, uh, it's, it's difficult, the system is not sustainable, and it's on the virtue of probably a civil war. But looking back earlier, again on transition, the one thing I've learned uh, by being in Eastern Europe is that as an economist, you tend to think of giving policy advice in a broad macroeconomic sense. And what I've learned is that economic reforms, as we as economists tend to give them, are quite irrelevant without institutional building. If you don't have rule of law, if you don't have a land registry, uh, if you don't have honest judiciary, honest police, honest tax collectors, you can forget about economic growth. Right? All that stuff that we, we were taught or what we can do here, it's not going to work. For example, most of the Eastern European countries at that time didn't have land registries. Now, you may think, and I've never even heard of that was I was giving advice here, but if you're thinking of doing an investment in a country and you want to buy something and you can't even be sure who the person is that you're buying it from, or if you buy it from that person and two years later someone comes around and says, that's mine, right? That's when you don't have a land registry. If your judiciary gets, um, is not paid by the government, that gets its it literally gets its income from the people in court, uh, you don't have a very good uh, system of judiciary. If all the police do not, do not get paid, but earn their income on the street by basically extorting money from you, then you don't have a, an honest system. So to try and build a market-based economy and have sustained growth, the first thing is building democratic institutions, fundamental institutions, because without those, all the good policies in the world, they won't work. If you can't build institutions, growth will not succeed. Fortunately, in Eastern Europe, they were able to do that, and some countries did it quickly, some countries did it very well. Poland, the Baltic countries, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, they went through a very difficult transition, and they've gone through it. The test now is for the Ukraine, and in fact, they're the country that needs help. Thank you very much, Scott, and thank you very much, Dr. Galal. I might ask Dr. Galal to come up, uh, and we have a few minutes for a Q&A. So why don't you come up to the mic, and, um, and I'll just 
<coughs> the moderate group. So I'm going to just go from the front to the back so the gentleman here. There are microphones, so if you could just stand and tell us. Uh, if you're affiliated with an institution, please tell us, and, and then you can have your question. Uh, I was. I was affiliated with an organization called the Parliamentary Center, which worked on parliamentary development in the Middle East, among other things. Uh, the question I want to ask is about the role of the international community in encouraging the transition, especially in, in governance. Uh, you accepted the con countries in conflict and the countries with the uh, natural resources and so on. Those are the countries that tend to attract most of the international attention. The countries in transition, where the hope lies, don't attract a great deal of attention. So could you just say something about, uh, going back to your introductory remark about Canada potentially having an important role in, in uh, this kind of situation, could you say something about how Canada should approach that? Um, yeah, I, I remember having a uh, dinner and uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton was then the Secretary of State uh, in, in the U.S. Anyway, uh, that was right after the January uh, Revolution in, in Cairo. And I remember making the following point to her. Uh, Madam Secretary, you need to remember that you were surprised by what happened in Cairo. Uh, to this is totally an endogenous process. This, this is really the outcome of a few Egyptians being unhappy with a few other Egyptians. And thirdly, the outcome is going to be what this group of Egyptians are going to do to the other groups of Egyptians. It, uh, political transitions fundamentally are local affairs. Different interest groups fending for their interests, colluding with other people, now, the most outsiders can do, at least, is to take, is, well, do no harm to begin with. I mean, I, I think, I think the, the, the worst part of the story is that outsiders often enough, rather than make things better, they make things worse. So that is the first suggestion I would make. But the second one is be on the right, on the right side of history and try to understand the nature of what's happening. I remember in the Egyptian case in particular, uh, there was this uh, idea that the ballot box is everything. You violate that, you violated everything. That's just not true. I happen to believe in liberal democracy. I don't believe in democracy. Democracy, period, is not necessarily good news. Ballot boxes can produce the worst of anything that you want. If you have no Bill of Rights, if you have no guarantees of liberties, Forget about the ballot box. Changing the identity of a country is something that you cannot sacrifice lightly. And I think the international community did not take the right position vis-a-vis -vis Egypt when Egypt went through that transition. And it, it did linger, it does linger uh, in, in some places up till now. So at a minimum, stay on the right side of history and understand things for what they are, not necessarily by what you think they are. And then third of all, of course, if you can uh, provide support. I don't think institutions can be exported. I don't think you can actually take an arrangement that works in one setup in Canada or in the US or elsewhere and implant them in Togo or some, somewhere else and think that they are going to function the same way. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. So I think be supportive of be on the right side of history, the side of people. Uh, uh, well, first one, do no harm. I keep repeating it because, in fact, I think my region has had more than its share of more harm was done to the region than, than, than help. So, so it is a very serious one. Uh, so if you can do good, don't do harm. I mean, you can always be supportive on the economic front, uh, on... on, on sticking to the right of people for self-determination or what have you. I mean, I, there are the, in the diplomatic area, in the economic area, in the, uh, the, there are lots of things that can be done. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think outsiders can establish democracies anywhere. Yes. And I think maybe we'll take uh, 
why don't we take one or two together? And then, and yeah, sure. Track of the sure. Things for you. So if you have a question, please come up behind the, the, uh, the person asking now, and we'll take a few together. Good evening. While uh, listening carefully to the presentation, which was uh, very captivating, I had to rack my brains and to be too up to the mark to understand. And uh, a lot of ideas floated in my uh, intelligence. I am asking the question, is the vision of the economist is compatible with the political vision of the many Arab words that we have at hand who are in difficult time. At the same time, it's a matter of vision. Which kind of vision do we have? Is it a homegrown vision applicable to each and every Arab country, or it is a foreign vision? And is it necessary to mix both of them to have a, a better vision of the Arab world, its problems, and how to resolve its many problems. When it comes to transition, what do we mean by transition? Which kind of transition would, do we expect? Is it a transition for education? Is it a transition for economic development? Is it a transition for democracy, accountability? good governance, or is it a transition for stability? You cannot do anything in our region, which is very peculiar, with different uh, countries, with different problems, different regime, without taking into account the absolute necessity to resolve the major conflict in some countries, the conflict in Palestine, the conflict in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya, are affecting the global vision of the Arab world, and they are a huge impairment for the development. And what I say that we have to be optimistic. I'm not a politician, but the vision that we have is to know how we can contribute by ideas by mobilization to solve those major problems. When stability is there, democracy will follow, government will follow. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank I'm Susan Shadler, a senior fellow at CG. Um, previously, before I was a senior fellow, I was an IMF staff member. And I worked a lot on the transition in Eastern Europe, not at all on the Middle East. So I can speak rather authoritatively on the transition in Eastern Europe, not at all in the Middle East. But looking at, and, and I also more recently have been looking a lot at Ukraine, looking at the IMF and what it's doing in Ukraine, I, I don't want to defend the IMF, and I certainly don't think they're perfect, but they are definitely trying to change the institutions. And if you look at this very large study that was done in the legal department of the IMF on all sorts of legal changes, basically what they're trying to do is create a legal order that is favorable to growth. And I don't think it's particularly Western-oriented. I think as much as possible they try to bring in institutions that are familiar to Ukrainians. But let's face it, if you have a corrupt system, there aren't many good institutions that are familiar to the population. So, so I think it's a little bit wrong to say the IMF went into Ukraine and just said, cut the budget deficit and float your exchange rate. They, they really have fundamentally tried to do more, although I don't think particularly successfully. So what is it about Central and Eastern Europe that really distinguishes them? And I look, in my experience, at two particular things. First of all, there were personalities that were big. Leszek Valserovich was, in some senses, the father of this miracle that occurred in Poland. And in Czech Republic, you have Havel and Vyskolo Klaus, 
who were also just big personalities that kind of carried the day. So it's, it's hard to say, oh, well, you just have to wait for the right personality to come along. But frankly, in the countries that have succeeded in a huge way and quickly, it's typically personalities. And I think the good thing about Ukraine is that they do have a truly spectacular finance minister. If anyone's ever going to bring that place right, it's probably going to be her. But second, um, and this is where the not importing systems from other countries um, raises some questions for me, because certainly what motivated the Poles and many of the other Central and Eastern European countries through some of the worst times, and they were bad at the beginning, was that they had the promise of getting into the EU. I mean, at the beginning, it was a little mm. bit um, implicit rather than explicit, but it very quickly became explicit. And basically, they were told, if you take the EU system, lock, stock, and barrel, put it in place, legal system, bureaucratic systems, open trade, uh, pricing systems, if you just take the European system and you put it in place, the acquis communautaire, you're in. And th that was hugely motivating for them. And I fear one of the problems in a place like Ukraine is they don't have the thing at the end of this big struggle that says to them, look, you're going to be part of a club that you're going to love. So I think there are a lot of um, things about importing systems that cut two ways. Thank you. Answer those two. Oh, and OK. I, I think one is about vision, you know, what vision do you want? But the yeah. second one, if I could just paraphrase, also to connect it to Scott. Yeah, I, I, are there models for <coughs> Yeah, with our friends from from Algeria, I'm sorry I didn't mention Algeria. Algeria is a country that we care about, we like, and I think Algeria deserves to uh, do better than what it has been possible so far. I think it has the enormous potential. Now, I think the word vision and compatibility of economists and politicians understand that everybody, all countries want, uh, I mean, you and I want to live happily ever after, right? I mean, we want to have our freedom and we want to be well off. And we want to live a system where our, you know, we are not threatened in any way, shape, or form. I, whatever political system that would enables you to do that is a good system, right? I mean, I think, I, vaguely speaking, that would be the vision. I think the other point that you are raising is a very interesting one because I had to also worry about it and agonize over it uh, a great deal. Which, is the, which also outsiders don't fully understand. It is the issue of liberties on the one hand and security and stability on the other hand. This is something, I mean, I, I, I found myself in one over dinner uh, with some friends uh, telling them, they were telling me, you know, in the Egyptian case, but you see there was that NGO that did not, uh, and I, was basically, I found myself telling them, you know, Egypt is not Switzerland. Switzerland is a country that is what uh, economists call steady state. You know, they, they have already reached the level where things are stable and everything is functioning. And, and in fact, in Switzerland, you can take your neighbor to court if he flushes the toilet after 12 o'clock uh, at night. I'm sorry, I get the guy banging on my top of my head and the car almost running me on the street. I, I mean, what is this? I mean, what are you talking about? So, so when you do have, when you are not safe and stable and your life is in decent shape, well, the rest is, is, so issues of stability are really important. And sometimes when security is, is, look at the US and what has happened after September 11. They have the homeland security. Uh, the, 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 the liberties were not as guaranteed as they used to be at an earlier stage. So when you are threatened, Sometimes, temporarily, one would hope, you will take certain exceptional measures. But the normal state of affair is that you are not supposed to be doing anything that threatens individual rights. Uh, so, so I would accept the compromise temporarily uh, uh, with the full understanding that this is really necessary for the time being. The problem with some regimes is that they take that temporary arrangement and they make, a, make it a permanent state of nature. That is a problem. The problem is not there is a trade-off between liberties and security. That the problem, honestly, is when the regimes use that as an excuse to perpetuate uh, oppression. 
That is a problem. And I think it is our responsibility, it's not anybody else's responsibility. Now, where I think the outside world is responsible is really in conflict countries. I think, without, I, I promised myself not to get into that uh, today, but, but in the Middle East, we think that many of the problems of the Middle East are made outside. Most of the conflicts in the Middle East are not made in the Middle East. They really have a brand name of somewhere else. But that's really a topic for another day. It's not, not for today. On the, uh, on the uh, uh, Susan's uh, interesting comments, uh, the IMF, I have a, a, a more of a problem with it than I have, I have uh, than you indicated, you know, the, or, or even uh, Scott uh, mentioned, you know, that the country is fragmented, the, the problems are structural, it's oligarchy, it's uh, all sorts of things. And then they go and tell them, reduce your budget deficit. And if you want my money, that's what I, 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 you can do for me. Well, I'm sorry, you're talking to yourself. You're not talking to the rest of the world. When I joined the government in July 2013, the only economic reform agenda that was in town between uh, January 2011, June 2013, was an IMF reform agenda. When I came to Ministry of Finance, the first thing I have done, I said, we don't want or need the IMF. Why? Because I believe that the diagnosis of the IMF of the problems that Egypt was going through at the time was focusing on one part of the, of the problem. It was basically macroeconomic imbalances, budget deficit and balance of payment deficit. And this is the problem that they were trying to cure with the measures that they were selling Egypt. My, I, Diagnosis of the problem is that we also had an economy that was sluggish. Economic growth was, oper the economy was operating ha at half capacity. Unemployment was rising. So that's a, a big set of the problems. And the third one was issues of injustice. I mean, uh, the issues of the poor were increasing in number. They used to be something like 15% of the population below one. I mean one dollar a day or something, they, it went up during the uh, transition period to uh, 26 percent. And if you do the two dollars, it's 40 percent of Egyptians considering themselves poor. I'm sorry, when you have a country, most of the people are poor, and you do have uh, half of the population not working. I mean, I'm so, what are you talking about? Macro balances is, is, the, is part of my problem. It's not my, the only problem I have. And I have people on the street, uh, with demonstrations, everybody's asking for something. So what do you do? You, you, you follow an austerity program and you, you tighten the belt further and you kill them more? I mean, I thought it was the wrong diagnosis and the wrong recipe. So when we talk about the IMF, I think we need to deal with problems of a country and alternative ways of dealing with the problems. When the US had the recession or the, the economic prob problems, they follow Keynesian economics. They did not follow orthodoxy economics. They did not do an austerity program to reduce the budget deficit. They went for expansionary fiscal policy. That's what Clinton has done. That's what I have done in Egypt when I was in government. We had two stimulus packages amounting to 3% of GDP. So the IMF has a problem that goes beyond the economics. It's actually sizing up the problem, the nature of the context of the given country, the multiplicity of the problems. I have been on their advisory board and I was telling them all the time, you worry about growth and you don't worry about distribution. Every time you tell a government, reduce your budget deficit, there are many ways of reducing your budget deficit. You can increase taxes on the rich, you can reduce taxes on the rich. You can uh, increase public expenditure in rural areas, you can reduce public expenditure in, uh, on Ottawa. I mean, there are many ways of doing it. So it's not good enough to tell someone, I want your budget deficit to be uh, lower. You have to worry about the composition and the content of what you're advocating because every one of them has very different consequences for different groups of people. They don't do that. So anyway, I have, I have reservations on the IMF package that they keep selling everywhere. On the issue of, uh, I like the idea of, you know, the, the, some of the Eastern European countries had the accession to the EU as an anchor, an external anchor. I think that's a fantastic idea. I do believe in it fully. But you have to remember that countries voluntarily decided they want to be members of the EU, and they voluntarily decided these are the, the reforms. Th this is the price. You want to uh, get to a movie, you have to buy the ticket. 
That's basically it. If they wanted to be part of the, of the club, they are, should be willing to pay the price for that, and it turned out to be good for them anyway, right? So this is not the equivalent of exporting institutions. This is actually a voluntary behavior on the part of countries, and does that makes a big, big difference. When I was in the World Bank, we used, we used that funny term, ownership, country ownership of the program. And in fact, the World Bank used to be to writing the ownership letter uh, for the countries that are supposed to own the program. <laughs> So, I, so I, 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 I guess that's pretty much all I want to say. Thank you. I'm done. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Galal. Uh, on behalf of the board of CG and on behalf of the president of CG, Rohinton uh, Madura, let me thank again Dr. Galal for his uh, presentation uh, this evening, and let me thank Scott Clark also for uh, the response. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, very distinguished guests uh, that are here this evening uh, and all of you for having joined us for this uh, very interesting conversation uh, this evening. So thank you very much for having joined us. Thank you.